Washington Journal continues. Welcome back to Washington Journal. We're joined by Frank Luntz. He is a pollster, author, and communication strategist, and we'll be discussing campaign 2024 with him, continuing that discussion, as well as some of the other political news of the day. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining us. So let's just get right into it. Tell, first of all, what is your role in Republican politics right now? Are you working for Trump or any of the other major candidates? Uh, if you... <laughs> If you saw the New York Times editorial, if you've seen any of the interviews, you would know the answer would be no to the first question. I want to report it. I, I'm a pollster. My job is to, to project what's going to happen and, more importantly, to explain what is happening. So I've been spending my time doing focus groups and interviews all across the country. There was a time when I would visit 30 or 35 states in a single year asking these questions about why people vote the way they do, why they think the way that they do. And actually, C-SPAN serves such an enormous purpose by giving voters a voice, because that's the number one thing. And it, I think it's the number one reason why Donald Trump was elected in 2016. People felt they had no voice. They felt that they were ignored, forgotten, or even betrayed. And that led to this level of anger and the need to shout out to be heard, and C-SPAN addresses that, but we need to do more in American politics to invite people in and to listen. I definitely want to get to a lot of those themes. Let's start, though. Trump has been indicted twice. There's a chance he could be indicted again by the uh, Department of Justice looking into January 6th. There's also the chance for an indictment in the Fulton County Special Grand Jury investigation as well into um, the 2020 election. I was going to, it doesn't seem to be making much of an impact among Republican voters. Why is that? And do you think that could be different? Could the indictments have a different impact in a general election among independent and swing voters? That's precisely, that is precisely the analysis that we see right now, Republicans think that Donald Trump is a victim. They think that he's being persecuted. And every time they issue an indictment or come very close to issuing that indictment, there's usually a four or five day period where Donald Trump controls the airwaves, controls the messaging, controls the context. And that allows him to explain his side of the story rather than the side that's that's prosecuting him. And in each of these indictments that he's had, his numbers have gone up. His support has gone up. The intensity of his, of his support has gone up. And I think we're seeing the same thing right now. It's unheard of. What we thought in 2016 that could not happen, happened. What we assumed in 2020 because of COVID, there's so many things that happen now. You've got the Capitol right behind you. No one, no one anticipated January 6th. Nobody anticipated that a president would not accept the fact that he lost, which will inflame your, your callers, I'm sure, but he did. And, and no one would have thought that a president could be indicted multiple times for multiple crimes and his numbers still go up, but they are. And at this point, if the primaries, caucuses were held today, Donald Trump's the nominee. But they're not being held today. It's six months from now. And some of these cases will probably take place during the primaries. Some of them have been pushed off to, to May of 2024, which means that Republicans will be voting without having heard the case, which should frighten them. In the end, it comes from a Simon and Garfunkel song. A man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. It's from the song The Boxer. And I think that's what hap what's happening to the electorate right now. They hear what they want to hear and they ignore everything else. So it's almost time for us to open up the phone line. So as you can tell, Frank Luntz is not going to mince words. You can start calling in now with your questions for Yelling him. Yelling at me. Or um, don't yell, but you can um, ask him any questions or share your thoughts about the 2024 election or political news of the day. Democrats. Your number is 202-748-8000.
Republicans 202-748-8001, Independents 202-748-8002. You can also send us a text message, 202-748-8003. We're going to get to some of those calls in just a moment. So last week, I want to read this. This is um, Republican operative Carl Rove. He wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed about Trump's effects on the GOP primary, the impact his rhetoric is having. So let me read a little bit from what Carl Rove um, wrote in this Wall Street Journal op-ed. He wrote, Mr. Trump's tactics are complicating things for Republicans. He claims the primary is already over, but if true, he should be working to unify the party. Instead, the former president is savagely attacking his opponents and their supporters, calling Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds ungrateful for remaining publicly neutral in her state's caucuses is stupid. So is calling financial supporters of his Republican opponents, quote, two-faced backstabbing rhinos and denouncing them as vultures, cowards and disloyal. Such over-the-top rhetoric gives his campaign a crazed tone and will permanently cost Mr. Trump's support among Republicans. Again, that's Republican operative Karl Rove. A lot of people are saying if Trump is the front runner, he thinks he is. Why is he not unifying the Republicans? He continues to attack his perceived enemies, his opponents. Do you think Trump can be a unifier? And is the GLP primary already over? Or is there a chance for some of these candidates? So I'm old. I used to be the youngest person in the room. Now I'm the oldest person in the room. And I remember when Ronald Reagan, the great Ronald Reagan, said that there is a commandment, an 11th commandment, thou shalt not attack other Republicans. There was a more, there was a decency back then. There was a civility. Ronald Reagan was a great president. And people from the left and the right acknowledged the impact that he had. And now this word rhino, Republican in name only, who's to say who's a Republican? Back in the 1980s, it was uh, you were for a strong defense. You would support countries that are seeking to be independent. You supported democracies. Ukraine is a democracy. It is a democracy. And yet Donald Trump attacks those who support Ukraine. We were supportive of immigrants, that people who wanted to come here, work hard, play by the rules. You're welcome to come here legally, but you're welcome to come. And now the hostility towards immigration because of the policies of Donald Trump. I heard callers before. He made, what I don't understand is he made some promises that Republicans so strongly support. Build the wall, right? 47 miles of that wall were built. What about the other hundreds of miles? Promised to revoke Obamacare. Whether you agree or disagree, these are things he said and it never happened. He promised to cut wasteful Washington spending and drain the swamp. The debt went up higher under Donald Trump than any other president. So these are questions that one asks. And I think it's so important that we seek some sort of common ground, decency, civility, that we learn how to talk to each other again. And yet our children are seeing these horrible examples of politicians yelling at each other. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can be decent to each other. Dignity, respect aren't just terminology. It's real. And later on the show, I'll talk to you about the three trends that I think are so frightening right now. But I would say to President Trump, a lot of people support you. But you may win the Republican nomination and lose the general election if you continue to alienate so many people by your words, your rhetoric, not necessarily your issues, but how you deliver them. And we'll get to some of your three pillars later, but I want to go to the phone lines because we do have some calls lined up. Gabriel is calling from Apex, North Carolina, on the Republican line. What's your question or comment, Gabriel? Oh, yes. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so, Mr. Lutz, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on C-SPAN for a couple of reasons. But um, I want to kind of go back. I, I sort of have a two-part question. The, the first part is really focused on how the media, in particular Fox News, which, you know, when I first started watching you, which were years ago, I would say like the, the late 2010, you know, right when I came back from Afghanistan, 
there was a lot of instances where you know you were doing talk groups and i was kind of becoming very kind of like active understanding fox news just because you know there was a lot of incendiary things this was the beck show this was the o'reilly factor all these things and there's a transition point where i and it's probably right around the tea party time where all of that rhetoric that was getting put out there had put us on this trajectory that I think is just has really landed us where we are, and it's and it's on both sides too. And I just want to ask you, what do you think your contribution was to that destabilization in the good civil debate that was there? Did you help it? Did you hurt it? Or what do you think, in hindsight, you could have done differently to change the course that Fox News and I think on the extreme left. Uh, MSNBC. I mean, because you're on C-SPAN, and this is really, the spin stops here. I mean, this is, I have no idea what the guest next to you believes, and that's the beauty of it. Brian Lamb has that built into the model, and that is what the press is supposed to be. It's not sexy, not sensational. It's real. It's fact-driven, and I think you played a part in derailing us from that, respectfully. And I understand Gabriel, you, you have a very valid point. Gabriel, so you've you. made, yeah, thanks for your question. Let's let Frank respond. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and by the way, that's an example of perfection. So, Gabriel, that's exactly what we should be doing. You have the, not only do you have the right, but you have the responsibility to challenge. And I love that. And my regret is I did not speak up earlier. So I've been writing editorials now. I've been doing appearances like this. It may interest you that I was on CNN Friday night. I was on MSNBC yesterday. I'm on here today. I may be on Fox tomorrow. I do them all. CNBC, Bloomberg, I do them all, BBC, because in the end, the truth knows no partisanship. It's the truth. And whether or not you have trust in your institutions, it's so important that you have a place to go that you can believe the information that's being given you. And that's one of my three pillars. We've lost that faith. We've lost that trust in the media, in that institution over there in the White House. We've lost it in health. We've lost it in everywhere except the military. And I think that I wish I had focused on, on defending the truth rather than just holding these focus groups and giving people their voice, which is important. I wish I had channeled that voice into respecting and revering the truth. And that's what I do now. All right. Let's take another caller now. Bruce in Memphis, Tennessee, Democratic Line. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Frank, I really appreciate you being on today. Um, I just wanted to ask you some real clear, simple questions. I know most questions are very vague, but um, I'm watching uh, this person, uh, Donald, try to become president, which he was, and, you know, he did what he did. However, you know, the question has not been talked about that if this guy gets convicted, how is he going to be able to vote? How is he going to be able to carry a gun? And why are people, you know, uh, dictating a narrative that's an illusion as to what it is that's real in the Constitution, in this country? And this guy talks about, well, people talk about two tiers. You know, I wonder what the opposite of the tier that they're creating themselves. And I just thank you because these real simple questions are not being brought out on the table and all these hyperboles of how these constitution, we haven't met this constitutional situation yet. We're in it right now and people are suffering because of this. And this guy seems like Richie Rich and going through a process that no one wants to say what is true. Well, the simple. So can you help me with that, sir? Because yes. I'm, I'm very perplexed with that. Yes, I can. And if I, if I were a teacher, I'd say that I understood your question immediately. And I would encourage people to, and I'll be specific and answer quickly, but I teach how to ask questions. And I got your point. And, and here's the problem. I don't know. We've never had a presidential candidate indicted. We had a president who ran from jail, Eugene Debs, a socialist, back in, I think it was 1920. But we've never had a major party candidate multiply indicted. And there are more indictments to come. So I don't know what's going to happen there. I will tell you this. People ask, why do individuals support Donald Trump? Because they feel he listens to them. 
They feel he fights for them. You may not like the way he fights. You may not like what he says. You may disagree with his point of view. But he does so in a way that they feel like their voice is being heard. And that's the problem. One of the problems, a lot of problems in America that need to be addressed, which is that people like you don't feel heard, don't feel respected, aren't dignified in your point of view. And, um, and I'm, I question whether he can put together a majority of America to win in 2024. So in that sense, you are correct. But he still speaks for tens of millions of people. And what he says is what they want to hear. Let's go to Champaign, Illinois now. Jack is calling on the independent line. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. You know, uh, Frank, I'm glad that you're on today. It's just telling us what you're hearing because I'm very confused of the support for Trump. I mean, it's it seems like a bizarro world. I've never <laughs> seen anything like this. I think people hopefully will wake up to the fact that he's a corrupt person and that they, you know, no, no matter what party you're from, you just cannot support such corruptness. We got to get away from uh, corrupt people, no matter what party they're in. They just got to get they got to see the corruption and say, no, that's not us. That is not America. We don't we don't support corrupt people. So anyway, that was my comment. Thank you. And by the way, I heard you use the word corrupt or corruption six times in one minute. So I know it's what bothers you. And to make you feel that you're not alone, it's the number one complaint that the public has about the system right now. And they use that word, the corruption in politics. And they think that it destroys the confidence in the country. Here's the challenge. I, we were just talking about this before we went on air. There's a wonderful lyric that Paul Simon wrote, and it's in the boxer uh, off the album, Reach Over Troubled Waters. A man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. If you get your news from Fox News, Donald Trump is a hero. If you get your news from MSNBC, Joe Biden is a hero. If you get your news from CNN, I, I don't know how to characterize that because it changed a little bit. But we hear what we want to hear. We ignore what we want to ignore. And it's so hard now because so many people are getting their news online from sources that, that affirm them rather than inform them. And that's one of the... One of the things I wanted to raise with you, the second pillar, 64% of 18 to 29 year olds, two thirds, know someone personally who has been harmed either uh, physically or mentally by social media. Two thirds, moms, 47%, half of all moms know a child who's been harmed in some way by social media. And this is the problem. It, it undercuts our acceptance of the truth or our knowledge of the truth. It undercuts our ability to relate to each other. Parents are so afraid that their kids can't communicate to each other, cannot have these conversations anymore because of social media, and they're getting addicted to it. So we hear stories, moms are telling me how their kids go under blankets, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., looking at their phones, can't put it down, go to sleep for maybe two hours, wake up and turn the phones back on again. You try to take that phone away from, from their child, and the child throws the phone at them, storms off. They can't communicate even in the household right now. And I'm afraid of its impact on politics because the truth matters. Not my truth, not your truth, frankly, the truth, capital T, capital T, and we're losing it. So, again, we are talking with pollster, author, and communication strategist Frank Luntz. We want to hear your questions or your comments for him about the upcoming presidential election or political news of the day. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Republicans, 202-748-8001. Independents, 202-748-8002. Before we go back to the phone lines, I want to bring up a question we received on Twitter from Parkstorm. And it asks, it wants you to tell us what you think about the dust up between Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and all the black Republicans in Congress. Now, before I um, get your answer, I want to read, pull up a little bit. This is an article in Politico 
about this issue. The headline says, DeSantis rocked by black Republican revolt over slavery comments. And I'll read a little bit from the opening paragraphs. It says, the bitter fight between Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Representative Byron Donalds over a line about slavery in the state's revised African-American history standards is infuriating several prominent black conservatives. Several told Politico they fear the issue will play into Democrats' characterization of Republicans as favoring a whitewashing of American history. Most saw it as an unforced error at the time when black Republicans feel they've been making significant strides within the party. What do you make about this make of this dust up? He made a mistake and he won't acknowledge it because he thinks that by acknowledging it hurts his campaign. He made a mistake on on beating up on Disney. The, the issue with DeSantis and he said to me personally, that I'm too hard on him. So I have to be, I want to be careful because I want to be fair. What he said, it's not just that it offended people, it's that it furthered the division between the black and the white population. What he said about Disney furthered these culture wars rather than addressing it and trying to solve it. You don't weaponize government. Republicans don't like it when Democrats do it. So why should they be doing it? And there's a reason why DeSantis' numbers have fallen so far. The guy's imploded. Now, make no mistake, Joe Biden had imploded in Iowa and New Hampshire, and he was the nominee and won for the presidency. DeSantis is not out of it. But when you make a political mistake like this, or a personal mistake, or you say something that really isn't right, isn't fair, isn't decent, which is what happened here, acknowledge it so you can move on. He won't acknowledge it. He claims that it was a bureaucrat who did it. He claims it was somebody else, not him. That he wasn't trying to make a point. Byron Donalds is a very good representative and a supporter of DeSantis up until that comment. You should listen to the criticism, accept it, so you can move on. Yeah, and we should note Byron Donalds uh, did support DeSantis for governor, but he is Trump supporter for 2024. Um, but definitely in the middle of that controversy with the governor of his home state. Let's go to Stanford, Texas now. Daniel, on the Republican line, what's your question or comment? Well, whenever, before Trump was even elected, they tried to impeach him. For four years after he was elected, they tried to impeach him. And, and whenever Hillary ran against Trump and lost, she spent $30 million on her campaign. And then when she lost, she turned around and sold $30 million worth of U.S. plutonium to North Korea. And North Korea is not our allies. My stepfather was in the Korean War. He was in South Korea. But um, that would be considered treason, and nobody said nothing about nothing and done anything about anything. And they've been hammering Trump since uh, for the last forever. You see, you're right. You're, you're, I agree with you. The Democrats don't want to listen to him. They don't want to respect him. The public supports border security. The border security that Donald Trump proposed, the public supports it. I think that the issue with Trump is less about the policies and more about the person and how he communicates and how he treats people. But yes, they tried to impeach him twice now. And that, that feeds into this perception of victimhood. And maybe there's something there. The Democrats resent how the Bidens have been treated. The Republicans represent how Donald Trump has been treated. And the problem is we are weaponizing everything. Each thing justifies another attack, another condemnation, another reason to write people off and write them out of the picture, not listen to them. I agree. It may surprise you based on my comments up to this point. But I do think that Donald Trump is mistreated, but he mistreated so many other people. And the one point I would make is, I remember the line about Hillary Clinton, how he made fun of her for wiping her server in the 2016 campaign. And what do we hear about Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago when they were subpoenaing his video that he tried to wipe those servers? I don't, th if someone figures out how to put those two together and they haven't so far, Trump will have a problem with that. 
Next up is Howard in Indiana, Democratic line. Yes, uh, I've got a, just a comment to make, and that is looking forward to our elections. We need to be clear on you know, what our duties are as citizens. We need to vote for governing political parties that advance our constitutional aspirations. And that framework, there's only one party, the Democratic Party, uh, in the work uh, uh, that Biden is doing in a uh, broad-based um, participation in our economy. We can see the results. Uh, in my view, there was never a justification for supporting Donald Trump. My concern with uh, your your guest is that he, he uh, paints a false equivalency between Democrats and Republicans. Republicans are a lost cause. They are a lost cause, and they should no longer uh, be a, a political party. They are and not that's the problem. In governing. And that's and the that's caller. Um, Howard, we're going to let Frank respond. And that's the problem. You have just indicted every Republican. There are Republicans who stood up to Donald Trump. There are Republicans who voted for his impeachment. There are Republicans who voted with Joe Biden and some of his legislation. Yet you say, and I quote, Republicans are lost cause. That's honestly what I'm fighting against. Some Republicans do fit that description, but a lot do not. Some Democrats want to work with the Republicans, but a lot do not. That's why I make the equivalency. It's happening on all sides. And I'm going to give you the third pillar now. My favorite question that I have asked of the last two years, are you invested in America and is America invested in you? 67% of Americans feel that commitment, feel that they've given something to their country or want to. And only 31% feel their country has given something back. When you have that gap, two thirds invested, only one third feel the country's invested in them. That's the reason why so many people are angry on both sides. They're giving. They're committed. They do the Pledge of Allegiance. They work hard. They play by the rules. They educate their kids. They're involved in their communities. They speak up on shows like C-SPAN. But they feel like the country's not listening to them. And it's happening on both sides of the aisle. We can't have that investment gap because we lose our democracy, we lose our economic freedom, and we lose something that's Pretty special if we do. Up next, we have Mary. Mary is in Cambria, California, independent line. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to say that I really like Vivek Ramaswamy. I think he's, um, I like his ideas on how he would negotiate us out of Ukraine more. I like how he, his ideas on revamping some of the institutions like the Department of Education and um, I just think that he is, um, he's articulate, and of course he's young, and I just can really see him on the stage with Justin Trudeau or uh, Rishi Sunak and Macron, and I just think that he would represent our country in a wonderful way that I haven't seen before. Now, I don't know everything, of all his ideas yet, because I haven't really um heard everything, his views on everything yet, but so far, I just really like him, and I like his energy. He's, he's, people are paying attention to him. He's attracting a lot of attention. Um, he has attracted significant sum of money uh, from across the country, which is why he qualified so quickly for the debates. There are three candidates that are moving, and he's one of the three, and a lot of people now put him in their top three. He's still not really breaking through, but I think, and I look forward to that first debate because I think he may. Uh, second candidate in Iowa is Tim Scott, who you heard a lot from in the hour before I came on. Tim Scott, for the Iowa voter, has that sense of decency, a faith-based message that Iowan voters really appreciate. And then in New Hampshire, it's Chris Christie. He's already in double digits. He did relatively well eight years ago in the state, and he seems to be uh, connecting with voters. So those are the three candidates that I'm watching at this point because they're poll numbers. You can actually see that movement already. So I want to pause. Just We've been talking, of course, mostly about the Republican candidates, but have you paid much attention on the Democratic side? Um, 
there are some Democratic challengers, but it's not as it's not perceived as competitive of a primary as on the Republican side. Do you think there's any possibility that Joe Biden is not the nominee in 2024? He'll be the nominee if he chooses to run. There's a possibility that he will change his mind. He is powerful as long as he remains the candidate. So I understand why he would announce. I understand what he would be running at this point. But I'm not convinced that he'll stay in the race. If he stays in the race, he's definitely the nominee. And I'm watching, actually, Robert Kennedy Jr. I know him a little bit. I've been on the debate stage with him once before. He destroyed me at the New School. I was a tough audience, a tough conversation on the environment. I held a different point of view at that time. Extremely articulate. His position on vaccines, I find awful. And I do so because I know how life-saving these vaccines are. And I'm so afraid that moms will not get their kids vaccine because they're going to listen to his arguments. That said, he is the most knowledgeable person on the environment. He is articulate about censorship and the right of every voice to be heard. So I'm kind of torn about it. And as a person, I enjoy talking to him. He's going to get more votes than people realize. And in New Hampshire, I could see him climbing into the 30 to 40 percent range, which is a significant amount for a challenger in a primary where the incumbent is running. He's not getting the nomination. He's not going to be on a ticket, but his voice is being heard. Let's hear from Amy now in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Republican line. What's your question or comment? My comments are about Trump. Um, basically, he said that he would drain the swamp, and he did drain the water from the swamp and reveal the swamp creatures, and they all got mad and launched an all-out assault on him. Amy, can and I ask you a qu Amy, let me, can I ask you a question? We can do this back and forth. Can I ask you a question? May I have permission? Sure. The debt under Donald Trump went higher than any other president in the four years. We didn't stop waste. The draining the swamp is preventing wasteful Washington spending, is it not? And yet they spent more. And the, two of those four years, there was a Republican Congress. So how do you drain the swamp if you spend more and more and more of your tax dollars? Well, he didn't have complete cooperation with things that he wanted. Republicans blocked him. No, his budgets. They were actually... Mm -hmm. Now, hold on, Amy. His budgets that he put forward increased spending. They didn't cut it. It was Congress who did not give him. Yes, actually, let me, let me correct myself. You're correct. Trump wanted to spend more. He wanted to give away more. And it was the Republicans in Congress who prevented him from doing it. Amy, any other response? Yeah. Um, now, I know he's not completely incorrupt, but he does try to fight against corruption. Now, there were some times that, yes, he did want to spend more than would be acceptable by the Republicans. There, there were those times. But in general, he wanted to eliminate corruption, even though he himself is not completely incorrupt. And, and, and can I ask you one more question? He promised in every campaign rally to build the wall. How many miles did he actually build? Again, I emphasize, with the Republicans controlling Congress. How much money did we get from Mexico? Because he promised they would pay for it. Amy? Yeah, I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't uh, address those issues, but... Um, Can I ask you one more question? He promised to abolish Obamacare. Did he? No, but... But, you know, he didn't have any help either. But he had a Republican Congress for two years. Uh, no, but they still didn't help him in his quest for that. Well, a good leader brings people along, and a great leader convinces people to move with him. So I appreciate your point of view. He did cut taxes significantly, but on these other issues, he just didn't do it. All right. 
we appreciate your call. Let's go to Sarah, Ashburn, Virginia, Democratic line. Hi, good morning. Um, I grew up in the shadow of Capitol Hill, um, and uh, we would go up where you could go and watch the debates, watch the debates on civil rights. Um, and I am amazed at the people that we have in Congress now. Uh, it's like we're going through the McCarthy era, the Nixon era, and now the Trump era all in one. Uh, even Newt could work with Clinton, uh, but this Congress under McCarthy um, is afraid to make a move without getting approval um, from the base uh, of of Trump's base, um, and you don't have professional politicians. I mean, Kennedy uh, could work with Orrin Hatch. McCain could work with anybody. Can I ask you um, a question also? Yes, please. Um, the Speaker of the House sat down with the President of the United States, and it looked like there was no common ground between them. And when they actually sat and discussed, what did we get? A debt ceiling agreement. All the Republicans aren't happy. The, 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 uh, the Freedom Caucus hates the agreement. On the left, the squad hates the agreement. But Speaker McCarthy and President Biden sat down together and got a debt ceiling agreement that everyone can live with. And then Kevin was able to get it passed through the House. Chuck Schumer joined him in the Senate. Isn't that a significant example of being able to work together. It's been the most important piece of legislation this year because our nation's economy was in jeopardy. And the two of them were able to get it done. To me, that's... Yes. Can, I, can I speak to something? Sure. That when now they have left the uh, Washington, they will only have 12 days when they come back to pass a budget and I don't know if they'll get through those programs. And I think it'll be a continuing resol resolution because I think uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greens are not going to support Kevin McCarthy, you know, going ahead and working again with the other side or with Biden. Uh, I think that's the way it's going to be but we because did, they're at loggerheads. But, but if they did it once before. Uh, you're, by the way, you're actually very sophisticated and you're correct. I believe you are accurate that they aren't going to get it done and they're going to need a continued resolution. So congratulations. Wherever you're getting your news, it is accurate. But in return, can you acknowledge that the speaker and the president did something significant together, that bipartisanship actually is able to work? She's gone, but um, I'm sure she'll continue to think about the, the things you've raised in your conversation with her. Let's bring up another caller, Peter, in Hollywood, Florida, Independent Line. Hello, how you doing? My name is Peter. Yes, Peter, go ahead. Hi, I'm going to be voting for Donald Trump. Uh, it, but I did vote for uh, Biden. Then Biden... I gotta be honest with you. I'm not very happy. Everything is more expensive. I can't hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead, Peter. All right. Well, anyway, everything is more expensive with Joe Biden. Okay. I'm gonna vote for Donald Trump because look, gas runs the economy. But gas runs the the stores. Let's put it this way. You go shopping at Publix, it's very expensive. So, yeah, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. I know well, Donald Trump, he can't use his mind very well. Are you still there? Yeah. Yes, and by the way, you're correct. Food prices went up significantly. If you don't like the prices at Publix, shop at Kroger. Um, they went up for gasoline. They went up for housing. They went up for health care. The inflation, which Joe Biden had said was, and I quote, transitory was significant and people got uh, salary increases, wage increases. The problem was that inflation wiped away the value of that. Now, inflation has begun to come down. Prices are not going up as fast as they were. So the question for Republicans is that will they be able to run on that in 2024? And the challenge for Democrats is to empathize that things are still expensive. The number one word that people speak of 
is, as their economic challenge isn't jobs, uh, it isn't um, opportunity, it's affordability, that they can't afford the things they need to live. And that will be a challenge for the Biden administration to address in the months ahead. All right, By Peter. the way, you're, you're, this is the best callers. They may, they may be mad at me, and I may not be saying to them what they want to hear, but in terms of knowing what's happening, this is the best callers I've had in a while. C-SPAN callers are great. Washington Journal callers are great. Another great caller, Jim, Charleston, South Carolina, on the Republican line. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, Frank, who did you predict was going to win the 2016 election? Uh, Hillary Clinton, based on the exit polling of that day, which had Clinton up by three points. And actually, here's what's interesting. So he wants to make the point that I'm wrong. Back in 2016, the exit polling all had Hillary Clinton winning. The CBS, ABC, NBC, the, all the pollsters, they do a consortium. What they had not done is the individual states. They had the overall numbers, and they were actually dead on. The problem for Clinton is she didn't have the right states. She beat Donald Trump in the popular vote, which he hates to acknowledge. More people like her, but they were in the wrong states. And we, by our Constitution, we do it state by state. So, yes, caller, I will acknowledge that I thought that Hillary Clinton would get more votes than Donald Trump, and therefore she'd get elected. Your and, question, and Frank, who did you vote for? Frank, who did you vote for in 2016? I'm t you know I can't answer that. Okay. Anything and else, who did Jim? You in, no, who did you predict in 2020? Joe Biden, and I was right on that one. And you think that, do you think that... Um, yes, I think Joe Biden did win. Care? I think yeah. Joe... I do think Joe Biden won. Before you cut him off, why do you think Donald Trump won? Did you see the interference by Facebook in, in the election with Hunter Biden laptop? Was that something you uh, acknowledge? Uh, I don't think that. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, 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 no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, let him answer, Jim. Yeah, I'm not hemming and hawing. Jim, you have a point of view, and that's the problem is that you're unwilling to see the evidence. You're unwilling to examine the facts. I've looked at this. I've gone and studied this. And here's our problem. The websites that have that the election was stolen, their stuff looks great. It looks professional. It looks like it's factual. It isn't. The Mules, the, the movie that had, that made the claim that all these ballots were dumped. Jim, let me tell you something about 2020. Because we saw it, and it happened. Republican voters, actually really good to do this. Republican voters voted on Election Day. Democratic voters voted early. Republican voters don't trust absentee ballots. They don't trust early votes. So when they count the ballots on Election Day, Donald Trump won by almost two to one. But so many people voted early, and those votes were Biden that even though the votes were counted early were Trump votes, the votes that came in, the absentee ballots and the early votes, Biden caught up and he went ahead. And you could see he was going to go ahead. We have to change the way votes are counted in this country because it's going to give a false impression that one candidate was winning. Donald Trump is ahead at 1 a.m., but that's simply because his votes were counted. And it took a day or two to count all those absentee ballots. Pennsylvania is the best example. It takes them four days to count their votes. Hey, Pennsylvania, get your act together. It was clear that Biden was going to win, but it didn't look that way on election night. So voters like him legitimately think that Trump won, legitimately think that ballots were dumped. They were absentee ballots, but they were going to be more Democratic, more urban, more Biden. Because Democrats vote early and Republicans vote on Election Day. Let's hear from Jasper now. Jasper is calling from Chicago on the Democratic line. Good morning, Tia. Good morning. I wanna, I wanna, good morning. I want to thank you all so much because we've been calling in like crazy for you all to have someone on to address these callers with these conspiracy theories. Thank you, Frank, so much for being here this morning. I am so happy to hear you, because on the Democratic side or Republican side or independent, these matters need to be addressed because our democracy is at stake. 
thank you, C-SPAN, for having them on. Okay, but I, I agree with that. Because if you don't believe in the truth, how can you campaign? How can you govern if the public thinks that you're evil? Which you know from yes. some of your callers. So I'm grateful for you saying that. I wish there wasn't a Republican, Democrat, and independent line. Because that plays into it. But, uh, uh, caller, we're failing. I don't want to, I know we're getting towards the end here. But the thing that I, I, I do want to emphasize is that we're actually failing to address the conspiracies. We're failing to get people to work across the aisle. And our democracy is at stake. I am concerned that 2024 will be the worst election ever. And I'm concerned that if Donald Trump gets the nomination, which at this point is more likely than not, he will never accept the election results. And we had the same thing in Georgia. Stacey Abrams on the Democrats. You can see that I'm gonna parallel, I will parallel all of this because I think that we all need to hold ourselves accountable. Stacey Abrams did not accept the election results in Georgia for governor. And that created unnecessary tension. Up until the last few years, the winner is accepted by the loser. The loser actually takes their support and says, our democracy is more important, our constitution is more important, our country is more important than any election. And I want to say that so clearly now to every Republican, every Democrat, and every Independent. We are in trouble. I wanted to do this. I'm so glad you invited me. We're, and I, yes, I started as a Republican, and I got 2016 wrong because I believe the exit polls. But I don't get much wrong. And we're yelling at each other now, and we're condemning each other now. And we collect our news to, in, not to inform us, but to affirm us. And democracies last until they don't. Empires last until they don't. The Egyptians thought they couldn't be beaten. The Romans thought they couldn't be beaten. The Turks, the Ottoman Empire... The great German Empire, British, Portuguese, French, countries come and go. China had a dynasty. Who's to say that America lasts? And I'm seeing the, the, the visions and the fractures in American society right now. I see it with our kids. I see it in the education system. It's not just the grandparents. The grandkids are getting the messaging to yell at each other and to be abusive to their teachers because they see their parents acting this way towards politics. And it's breaking this country. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much, pollster, author, and communication strategist Frank Luntz. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.